to those who call evil good and good evil. Who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness. Who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever and shrewd in their own sight. Woe. Woe. Woe to those. Now some of you came in and you were like, oh, finally he's done with the Woe series. Psych. We got one more left in us here. Uh, so I, I'm gonna, if you haven't been with us, I would encourage you to hop online, catch up on this series. I believe that God is, is uh, really trying to wake the church up to understand the times that we live in and what he's calling us to do during these times. Isaiah chapter five, verse 20, amplified version says this, woe, judgment is coming to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. So if you were with us over the last few weeks, you know that we've talked about all different things, some cultural things, some things that people might mark as political. And I just want to again say to you, this isn't about politics. It's about what scripture says. How many of you know, it doesn't matter what party believes it. If it's against this, we need to stand for truth. And we need to understand that that's what God is calling his church to be, all right? Um, last weekend, we, we talked a little bit about, about Lot and how he, uh, he, he kept uh, getting closer and closer to Sodom and, and just kind of little compromises. And again, if you missed that, I would encourage you to get online. But the other thing that happened last weekend was we were able to do baptisms, not only here, but at our Wyoming campus. And so I want you to watch this video and see just the highlights of what happened this last weekend. How cool is that? We got to baptize 22 people last weekend. That's pretty amazing. So uh, I just want to, uh, as we jump into this last uh, message in this series, I, you know, I started, it was months and months and months ago that God laid this series on my heart. And, and so in my, in my uh, notes, I'll always keep like, here's kind of some things that I'm thinking about as we move towards this series. And as I began to write my note, uh, there was one particular verse that I had written down and I was like, okay, you got to preach that. And can I tell you that I, week one, I was like, nah, week one, I'm not going to do that one. And week two, nah, I'm not going to do that one. And week three, nah, I'm not going to do that one. And I was supposed to end at week four, week four, nah, I'm not going to do that one. And then we got to last weekend and last weekend we were supposed to be done with woe. But then I really felt like God was, was calling me to this place of talking about Sodom and Gomorrah for a little bit. So we did that. And then we had asked Mariah if she would share her testimony. So if you're with us last weekend, you know that we played that video of Mariah sharing her story. And can I tell you the verse that God had told me months and months and months ago to use? Mariah said it in her testimony. And I was like, okay, God, I hear you. All right. <laughs> Let's be real, sometimes I'm a little thick-headed, and, and so God has to use unique ways to get my attention. And so today I want, you to, I want to read you this story, um, and the last part is what Mariah referenced last week in her testimony. But Matthew chapter 12, starting verse 38, says this, One day some teachers of religious law and the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to show us a, a miraculous sign to prove your authority. 
But Jesus replied, only an evil, adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give you is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The people of Nineveh will stand up against this generation on judgment day and condemn it, for they repented of their sins at the preaching of Jonah. Now someone greater than Jonah is here, but you refuse to repent. The queen of Sheba will also stand up against the, this generation on judgment day and condemn it. For she came from a distant land to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Now someone greater than Solomon is here, but you refuse to listen. When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, seeking rest and finding none. Then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they all enter the person and live there. And so the pers uh, that person is worse off than they were before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. Let's pray. God, as we just spend the next few moments looking at your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us what we need to see. God, I pray over our Star Valley campus and our Malawi campus. And Lord, we're just so grateful for the things that you're doing, even through this ministry in the jail. God, I just pray, Lord, that whoever hears this word, that God, their heart would be open, that Lord, the, the soil would be right, and that Lord Jesus, we will hear what you have to say. God, that I'll get out of the way and that you will be front and center. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. So I've preached thousands of sermons in my life, and this is the first time I've ever preached this particular story. So the first part of it isn't the part we're going to focus on, but I just want to kind of reference it for a moment. The Pharisees come to Jesus and they're saying, hey, prove to us that you are who you say that you are. Prove to us that you have the authority. And Jesus basically says, hey, listen, there's all these other generations before you, and they believed even without seeing me and seeing the signs and wonders of me. And he said, you're basically evil because of this, because you, you can't just believe, you just can't have faith. And I believe that we live in a day and a time right now, whereas the church, we need to understand that we are the, the body of Christ, that we are the ones that show this world who Jesus is. And I, and I know that the day and time that we live in is getting more and more corrupt. It's getting more and more hard. We, but we as a generation have been spoiled with our access to God and the things of God. So many cultures would kill to have their, the ability to read scripture, to have the Bible in your pocket wherever you go. All of those things to participate in corporate worship, to, uh, to not only have that, but to also be able to, I mean, you can listen to people preach all day long, every day if you wanted to. You can listen to your Bible being read to you for goodness sake. There are people all in this world, in this day and time right now, who would, who would not even believe that that's possible. Because if they could just own a piece of a page of the Bible, they would be in awe of just owning that. But yet we have become a spoiled generation. And because of that, we sit back and we allow the enemy to keep taking and keep taking and keep taking Tonight in this message, I'm going to reference some things that I, that I read out of a book uh, called The Return of the Gods. It's by Jonathan Kahn, and I, I'm putting it up here. And, I, and if you like what I preach about tonight and you want to go deeper than what I'm going to talk about tonight, then I would, I would say get the book. If you don't like what I'm preaching tonight, then don't read this book, Okay. And I'm not preaching the book. I'm not, taking, I'm not taking snippets out of it, but I am. There's some direction that he, that he points towards that I'm gonna reference tonight because I really found it interesting and I feel like we're at a space in time where we need to be wide awake. Not woke. Awake. Okay? Difference. We need to be awake. So according to Jonathan Kahn, this parable we see that it is found in a couple of the gospels, but it is, it is about spiritual warfare and the resurgence of ancient pagan practices in our society today. So in this parable, Jesus describes a man who a spirit is cast out of 
And then the, the spirit goes out into the wilderness and then says, I'm going to go back and see if I can go back to where I came from. And he comes back to find it swept out and clean, but empty. So he goes and he gets seven other spirits that are worse than him and they all come and now live in the man and he's worse than he was when he started. So many believe that this story is an allegory to how spiritual emptiness can invite greater forces of darkness. And I, I want to talk about this for a few moments because I believe that we live in a time right now where, uh, where we have become spiritually empty. This parable reflects a pattern seen throughout history and particularly in this modern era. If society or individuals attempt to rid themselves of negative or demonic influences, if they fail to fill that void with righteousness or divine truth, they are vulnerable to an even more intense resurgence of those dark forces. And so this would explain our culture right now. Our culture now has gotten to a place where, uh, where now even the occult and those kinds of things are, not only are they prevalent, but they are out in the open. Like we're not even hiding it anymore. Now I'm going to really age myself because when I was growing up and I was like, uh, I think I was in maybe elementary school or middle school, they, we'd have these guys come and they'd preach at our church and they would talk about back masking. How many of you know what I'm talking about with back masking? There's a few of us. All right, perfect. So it was where you would play a record backwards and it would say things. And I don't know if that was true or not. It was really weird, some of the stuff that things would come out when you'd play some songs backwards. And when you played them forwards, they didn't make a lot of sense, right? They were songs that you're like, what are they singing about? And then you play it backwards and it's like, it's got some dark message in there. I don't know if that was true or not. If it was true, if there's any truth to that at all, it was a time where it was hidden. But now we live in a time where it's not hidden anymore. It's out in the open. It's where everybody can see it. And, and so as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about the U.S. And, and we were founded on this Judeo-Christian belief system. And that it's one of the only cultures throughout all of history that was founded that way. So that, so that for decades and decades, and, and, and we, we lived in a space where, where we didn't see people like worshiping idols and all of that kind of stuff. Because there was a foundation in this country. And then in the 60s or so, we began to push God to the side and eventually out. We, we saw prayer removed from school. We saw abortion legalized. We saw all of these things take place that were very much pushing God out of the, of the town square. And now we're in a place where, some of you are, you, are you still okay with me right now? Some of you look really uncomfortable in this moment. All right. As we look at this, though, we see that as God is pushed out, I believe that this story that we just read that Jesus tells is that this man, uh, it's not as much about a man, but it's about a generation. We see that in verse 45. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits, more evil than himself, and they enter the person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. So what Jesus is doing is giving a warning because otherwise that story makes no sense in context with what Jesus is talking about, yeah. right? If all of a sudden he's just like, hey, let me just tell you a random story about a guy who had a demon. No, he's saying, what I need you to understand is that if you're gonna, if you're gonna live this way, you're gonna leave room. And so we have allowed tolerance of other beliefs to become intolerance of God. We've gotten to a place, I remember when, we, when Shannon and I were youth pastoring, we went and we, we went to this seminar, it was put on by a guy named Josh McDowell, and this was in the 90s, and he was talking about how tolerance was going to usher in this space where all of a sudden God is going to be removed from our culture. And I remember hearing that because thinking the word tolerance was always something that was like, was, was, seemed like it was positive, like, oh, we need to be more tolerant. But as he began to lay out the case, I began to understand that is absolutely what has happened over these last few decades is that we've gotten to a place where we just say, hey, we'll tolerate everything. And now what's happened is God is now removed from the picture. A fence is a tool used to keep polite believers at bay. 
We got to be careful what we say because we don't want to offend anyone. Hey, don't, don't talk about that because that could be offensive to someone. Yeah. Keep your mouth shut because what if you, they're offended by what you say? They'll never come to church with you if you offend them in any way. Can I tell you that that is such a lie from the enemy? Because what he's telling you to do is act like them so they'll like you. But then why would they want Jesus? They don't need Jesus. Because you're acting just like they act. But what if we stood on something? What if we stood for truth? What if we believed something and actually acted on what we believed? Because when we do that, all of a sudden, guess what? We look different. For those of you who are filling in the blanks on the app, I jumped ahead of myself apparently earlier. We need to be awake, not woke. That's, that's here in my notes, but I said it way earlier. So there you go. We have lived in a time and a place where things have been pretty much moderate. So we've kind of stopped paying attention. We've stopped really being on guard. We've lived in a country that has been a great country to live in. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of faith. We can go to church when we want to, except for when COVID hits. And then all of those things are great. But now we've gotten to a place where the church is sleeping. And we got to wake up. We got to pay attention. Oxford Dictionary Word of the Year in 2016 was post truth. Here's what they wrote. They said, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion that appeals to emotional and personal belief. So what is this saying? This is that point in our history where we moved from there being truth to being your truth and my truth. And, can I, and, I, and you've heard me say this even in this series. I've said it over and over again because some of you were talking to your neighbor last time I said it, so I want to make sure you hear it before I end this series, okay? There is no your truth and my truth. There is the truth, okay? So when you hear that, and now that I've said it, if you haven't paid attention before, you're going to hear it a lot. You're going to be watching a TV show and they'll say, live your truth, Okay? What is the truth? Not your truth, not my truth. Because when all of a sudden I get to determine what's true and you get to determine what's true and what you determine is different than what I determine, then there is no truth. It's just our opinions, right? So call it what it is. My opinion is this, not my truth, right? So we see that in 2016 that things began to take this even more radical turn and we've moved away from truth and allowed emotion to drive our culture, so how can we get, keep ourselves from getting swept up in all of the cultural divisiveness? It is a divisive time. And that's when, when I talked to you a few weeks ago, I said, listen, some of this is going to sound like it's political, but that's because everything today has become political. You can't even say what kind of ice cream you like without somebody going, oh, what are you, some kind of Republican? Right? <laughs> I mean, it's stupid. Everything is. And I believe that that is a scheme of the enemy. Because the more he can divide us on everything, the less we'll pay attention to the important things. So I want us to read a, a couple of scriptures here. Matthew chapter 26, verse 41. Jesus is in the garden, Gethsemane. And he says, watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then we're going to skip to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be alert and sober mi of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So in this fast-paced world, it's easy for us to get swept up in the currents of daily life and become spiritually lethargic. But Jesus and Peter both call us to a higher state of awareness and readiness, to be awake, to be vigilant, to live with a deliberate focus on our spiritual journey and recognize the ever, the, the more that we need wisdom and we need his strength inside of our lives and we need to be paying attention. Jesus' words in Matthew come during a moment of intense turmoil. He's preparing for crucifixion and he urges his disciples to remain vigilant in prayer. Now, Jesus had a lot on his mind in that moment. But he's, he's saying, listen, guys, things are about to get rough. So I need you to what? 
watch and pray, right? Not watch and fight with your neighbor, not watch and make big banners and, and you know, go downtown and yell at people that they're going to hell. Watch and pray. Be vigilant, pay attention. What's going on around us? What's happening in your kid's school? What's happening in, in your neighborhood? What's happening with your coworkers? Pay attention and pray. Watch and pray. The disciples, they're weary and they fall asleep and they miss this opportunity to fortify themselves before the, uh, the oncoming trials. Jesus' call of the importance of staying alert and connected to God, especially when we're in the face of our challenges. And similarly, we see in Peter's words that he's saying, listen, uh, things are about to get real and you need to pay attention. This image of the lion invokes a sense of danger and urgency. Being alert and of sober mind means that we're aware of the subtle ways in which the adversary might come and pull us astray or exploit our weaknesses. And so I want you to understand, and I hope that over this last few weekends as we've looked at this, that you're understanding the dark times that we live in. Yeah. Now, I understand for some of you are like, we get it already. It's dark and it's going to be hard. Can you move on and give us some like a back rub next week or something? <laughs> We're going to start a new series next week, I promise. This time, I, I, for real, we will. Um, but... But I do want you, I want you to hear this because look at Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. It says this, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, yeah. against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in heavenly places. It was interesting last week because um, Deb, one of our great prayer warriors here at the church, she came, out, came to me after uh, church and she said, she said, hey, I was thinking about this and Scripture says that we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting against spirits. And she said, who is, who is the enemy fighting against? And she said, he's not fighting against spirits because he's already lost to God. So he's fighting against flesh and blood. And it's interesting because we need to understand that our adversary isn't trying to fight against God. He already lost that battle. So he's actually fighting us. He's doing what he can to, to derail us and to keep us from where we're supposed to be. But, but these who are not flesh and blood enemies are demons over whom the devil has control. They are not merely fantasies. They are, they are very real. And we face power, a powerful army whose goal is to defeat Christ's church. And so I want us to look at this for a moment. And some of you are, again, maybe this is making you a little uncomfortable, but what you need to understand is you're, you're sitting in a church and we believe this book to be true from cover to cover. It is truth. So when it talks about our battle isn't with flesh and blood, we need to realize that means there are spiritual things that are happening. There are principalities and powers that are at work inside of our lives. And so we need to be aware of them. Because oftentimes we are easily deceived because we are not alert and we're not paying attention. In this book that I referenced earlier, they talk about this. And I want to I just pull out a little bit of it. And I want to I just give you a couple of thoughts that I gleaned as I read this book. In this book, Jonathan Kahn uh, recognizes what he calls the dark trinity. And these are pagan spirits. And he believes that they are at work in our society today. Now, his theory is this, and you can take this or leave it. It's up to you. Because this, uh, this part, I'm not preaching right out of the word. I'm giving you this guy's opinion. But I actually tend to lean towards it and believe it to be true. He's saying that when, when this country moved to a place where we removed God from everything... We said, you can't talk about God anymore. You can't, you can't, you know, and, and he's been, now he's being more and more removed from the public square. If there's anybody, everybody can have all the rights in the world, but if anybody can, that they're okay with taking rights away from, it's, it's the Christians, right? You can't make fun of anybody. You can make fun of Christians. We saw it at the Olympics, right? And so, so we know that that's, that that's okay. And so now with that, his, his thought behind that is, is now we've removed God and what have we left? We left an empty space. Yes. And so now some of these, some of these uh, demonic gods from the, from the past that we read about in scripture have now come and they are being prevalent in our society today. So hear me as we talk about this because maybe, you'll, maybe you're going, ah, I don't know about this. Well, listen, because I, I think you will know in just a moment. 
So the first one that he references in this book is called Baal, and he's known as the possessor. In scripture, Baal caused Israel to forget about God. And America, since the 1960s, has more and more forgotten about God. And our journey to where we find ourselves today started with just that, us forgetting about God. So when Jesus says that he is the truth in Luke chapter 1, is there any, uh, is there any wonder that when there's, when there's a spiritual battle going on, those spirits are going to push for us to not to believe in one truth? Because if they can get us to believe there isn't just one truth, hey, coexist, everything's equal, everything's the same. The problem with that is Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Not through Baal, not through Buddha, not through any of those things, right? They come through Jesus. So either he is who he says he is or he's a liar, right? So we, if we believe in Jesus, we got to understand that's what he says. So the enemy... The one that is the, the, the possessor is the one that's going to come in and he's going to push against that so that we, in, in, even if our hearts are in a good place, well, I just, wanna, I just want everybody to feel loved. I want everybody to just feel accepted and everything is okay and you believe what you want to believe and I'll believe and we'll just all coexist together. Well, what we've done then is we've removed truth and when God's, when, when God's word tells us that he is truth, now all of a sudden we don't need him anymore. The second one is Ishtar, the enchantress. And all of these are gods that you will find. If you look in the Old Testament, you can look in your Bible right now, you'll find them. So, so these, aren't, these aren't from his book, these are from the book. This is the goddess of sexual immorality. Greeks call this goddess Porne. Isn't that interesting? Yep. The sexual revolution ushered in tolerance for all things unholy from promiscuity, promiscuity to pornography. She also promotes androgyny, which is being both male and female. Isn't that interesting? It can be whatever you want. The symbol for this goddess was the rainbow. In biblical times, she was known for pride. None of this is new, folks. None of it's new. But we, it's been packaged in such a great way that, hey, we don't want to look like we're, can I tell you, this is spiritual. Yes, it is. It's real. Yes, it is. And I get it, some of you are super uncomfortable with me right now. But what, I need you to hear it because we've got to be alert. We've got to realize that there is a cunning enemy and he seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. Yeah. And if the church will buy in because it looks nice and it's packaged well, then guess what? The enemy just walks right through. We have left a void and the enemy is filling it. We have pulled back and he's moved in. The third one that I want to talk about real quick is, is Molech, and that's the destroyer. His name makes several appearances in scripture. For example, when King Solomon fell away from God, he built high places, altars, and sanctuaries to foreign gods. One of them is Molech. In this time, uh, it was prevalent for them to do child sacrifices to Molech. They would, they would sacrifice children and they would, they would do this so that they could have uh, a better life for themselves. Something's going wrong in their life, they would sacrifice a child at an altar to Molech so that, so, so that their life would be better. Now we're talking tens of thousands of, of babies probably were sacrificed back in the day in America, there's been 60 million sacrifices and counting. This spirit has infiltrated our culture with the lie of women's health. And I know some of you sit in the room and you've walked through this and this is a hard message. It's hard for me to speak on it. It's hard for you to hear it, but I want you to hear this. If, if that's been something that's been in your past, can I tell you there's forgiveness, there's healing, there's hope. 
There's no shame. There's no, none of that. That's not what I'm saying right now. But what I am saying is this. When you say, oh, that's political, it's not political, it's scriptural. Amen. And, and it used to be that you could make the argument, maybe you could go, oh, well, I don't know, because at three months, it's this. At the, but scripture tells us that he knit us together in our mother's womb, right? He knew us, right? So, so you make that argument. But now we're getting to the place where now they're aborting at birth, That is child sacrifice. I'm sorry. It, it's packaged different. We're not taking the baby to an altar, but what we're saying is my life will be screwed up if I have this kid. So for a better life, I'll sacrifice. Back to Jesus' story. The demon is cast out. And comes back to find the person empty but clean. That, I found that interesting. It was, I, I read the story lots of times because I was thinking about preaching this. And then this last week, we, we had this amazing worship time over at City Life on Wednesday night. If you missed that, you missed out. It was so good. But I was sitting in that worship time and this verse kept coming into my, into my head, this story. And, the, and it, it, it stopped there because one translation says it that way. He came back to find it empty and clean. And as I was thinking about that, I, th I thought to myself, isn't that kind of how a lot of our spiritual life is? Empty and clean. We're, we're trying to live a clean life. We're trying to be the best that we can be. But maybe you even sit in the room today and you feel as though your spiritual journey is empty. Can I tell you, that's not how God ever intended your spiritual journey to be. He didn't want it to be empty. It's not supposed to be empty. See, some of us, we accept Christ and we strive to be clean. In Ephesians, Paul tells us that we are not to be empty, though we are to be full of the Holy Spirit. We need to fill the void with him. It isn't about not sinning. It's about being a new creation. It's not just rejecting negative influences, but it's actively embracing positive divine truths to prevent a worse spiritual condition. Look at this story for a moment. This guy is tormented with an evil spirit. It gets cast out. He's good for a bit, but then all of a sudden now eight, because one invites seven more, come and they, they now make him worse than he was before. And I see people who will accept Christ and they get this new understanding that Jesus loves them and that he forgives them and he's got great things for them. And then all of a sudden, because they don't fill that void with anything, yeah. then all of a sudden they find themselves worse off than they were before. Yeah. Right so I want to talk to you because that man, you're like, oh, wow, this is super encouraging, Jason. We got demons, we got emptiness. Oh, what else do we got? What, what's behind door number four? This is amazing. But can I tell you, that's not the end of the story. There's choices, right, that we can make. And as we make them, we're going to see God move. And so there's three things that I want to quickly go over with you. And the first one is we need to cultivate awareness inside of our lives. That's what this series has been about. Just as a watchful guard keeps uh, keeps his eye on put out for potential threats, we are called to be spiritually discerning. This involves not only paying attention to culture, but regular self-reflection and examination of our lives. Uh, as I was thinking about that, I'm thinking, you know, for many of us, what we need to understand is that, that when we pay attention and we go, you know, God, I need to be filled with you today. When you wake up in the morning, you're like, man, I am going out there. And even if everything in my world looks pretty normal, there are spiritual things happening around me. And so, Lord, I just need you to, to be in me. I need to be, I need to have your strength in me. I need to have your spirit in me. And so if, if we would wake up in the morning and just spend a few moments saying, God, prepare me for today. Get me ready so that I can go and, and I can make an impact in this world. And I can take back from the enemy what he continues to try to steal. And so when we do that, all of a sudden now, we've cultivated this awareness. Being awake and vigilant is not about living in fear, 
but about embracing the fullness of life with a clear, purposeful focus on our relationship with God. So I tell you this stuff not so that you're walking around like freaked out that there's spiritual stuff going on around you all the time. Because guess what? Greater is he that's within you than he that's in this world, right? So we don't have any reason to be afraid, but we do have to pay attention. Sometimes we, it's easier to not hear about this stuff. You know, I don't really want to know. La, 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 right? How many of you know that doesn't work? We got to be awake. We got to pay attention. The second thing is to commit to prayer. Prayer is a vital tool for remaining vigilant. Some of you, your prayer life consists of when someone stands on this stage and prays. Or maybe it's before a meal, you say a prayer. We live in dark times and we need to be prayed up. We need to spend time in prayer. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. God gives us a recipe. And obviously there's other things in there besides pray, being humble and turning from our wicked ways. All of those things are important. But prayer is in that list. We need to pray. We need to, we need to believe. We need to trust. We need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our country. Yes. We need to pray. Yes. We can't just sit back and go, well, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to vote in November. The reality is it doesn't matter what man or woman holds that office Amen. if we're not a people of prayer. Woo, we have to pray. Our, our hope is not in flesh and blood. Our, our hope is in God Almighty. And the third thing is to stay rooted in the word. Yes. Scripture is our guide. It's our source of wisdom. So we need to regularly study it. We need to regularly be in it. If you're not regularly in the word, can I just tell you what I'm missing out on? Here's the thing. If you're not, I'm going to challenge you to just, even if it's tomorrow morning, you wake up and while you get your cup of coffee, you sit at your kitchen table or you sit in your study or whatever you have and you open up the word and you just begin to read. And as you do that, before you do that, even just pray and say, God, will you show yourself to me today? Yes. Can I tell you, his word is alive. Yes. Some of you, the problem is, is you'll just kind of open the book and then you'll find yourself in the so-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And you're like, this is really boring. I don't know what we're even talking about right now, <laughs> right? This thing is not boring. And it's alive. So if you'll pray and say, God, will you speak to me through your word? He will. He is so faithful to do that. But we need to be regularly in his, in his word. We need to meditate on what he says. Why has the enemy pushed to discount the truth even of scripture? We see that. And again, I, I don't want to be a broken record here, but you are in a church that believes this book and not every church in this community believes this book. And you got to pay attention. If you're visiting here and you are from another church, make sure that they believe the whole book. Hallelujah. Because if they don't, what happens is we start taking pieces out. Why? Because if we can remove parts of truth, there's, there's a, a church in town that one of the pastors told me that Jonah was a parable. That wasn't a true story. Jesus just called him a prophet. How, could he, how would he do that if that was the case? Right? So... So as we look at the book, we need to understand this is truth. So when the enemy is doing what he can to try and remove scripture, remove it from the public square, now remove it even from the church, why is he doing that? Because he knows that that's where he's defeated is in the truth of God's word. So let us remain alert, grounded in faith, and ready to respond to the opportunities and challenges that come our way. In doing so, we honor God and we protect our spiritual well-being. I believe that there is a return to some of the ancient demonic forces that once dominated ancient civilizations. And they are reappearing in new forms. 
Without a spiritual awakening or a solid foundation of faith, the same cycle will continue to happen. But the good news is it doesn't have to. We serve a God who is bigger. We serve a God who is greater. And so let's not give in to things that we don't have to lose to. Let's not quit when God is calling us to win. Let's not compromise when he's calling us to victory. Let's be clean and full, but not clean and empty. So in your life, what that means is to say, God, I, I want you to fill every part of me. This morning, Holy Spirit, will you just come and fill me so that I'm ready to face this day. Let's pray for our culture that, that God will be welcomed back into our culture again. That the void that's been left will now be filled not with every other spirit, but with his spirit. Let's pray as a church. When was the last time, if you were honest, that you prayed for revival in our community? What would happen if every believer in this community, not just from River of Life, but in the community, began to actively pray for God to show himself in Missoula and in the Bitterroot and in Montana? What would happen? God would show up. The problem is we become so self-reliant and okay with being clean and empty. And God's calling us to not be empty anymore. Let's press in. We need to stand. We need to have awareness. We need to pay attention. And we need to know that God is calling his church to be victorious. I know for some of you, this made you uncomfortable. Some of you, this is all new. You don't even know what I'm talking about maybe, or this is confusing to you. And I understand that. If you hear nothing else of what I said, then hear this. God is calling his church to look different than this world. He's calling us to stand for truth. He's calling us to be light in the darkness. How many of you know when, if it's, if we turned off all the lights in here and it was pitch black and one of you just pulled out your cell phone and turned on that flashlight, everybody would see it. It would be noticeable. We are to be noticeable in this world. Not to bring glory to us, but to point to him. I'm asking everybody in the room if you'll just close your eyes with me for the next few moments. And to be honest with you, as we wrap this up today, I really felt this tug in my spirit this afternoon as I was praying about tonight. That I believe that there are many of us in this room, and maybe you've been in church for a long time, but if you're honest, you've been okay with just being okay you've been all right with just being where you've been and i really believe with all my heart that god is is speaking and i I pray my prayer today was that the holy spirit would stir you today that the spirit would move inside of you and say i don't want to just be okay with my faith I want to lean in. I want to I want to not only experience fullness of God inside of my heart. I want that to I want that to pour out on every person that I meet. I want them to know that there's something different about me. I think there's just too many people that call themselves by his name and they're okay with being empty and clean. And God is saying, "I never wanted you empty. I wanted you full." So tonight, if that's you and you just, in these closing moments, as we just spend a little bit more time in worship, maybe it's an opportunity for you to come to an altar and just say, God, fill me. Fill me with you. Fill me with your purpose. Fill me with your desires. Fill me with the love that you have. Fill me with whatever it is that you have for me. Pour into me. Can I tell you, a prayer like that, God answers those prayers. He will not disappoint you. If you need prayer for anything, there will be prayer teams down here who would be more than happy to pray with you about whatever's going on in your life. But I just really, in this closing time of worship, can we just set everything else aside and examine where am I with God? And Lord, if there's emptiness in me, if there's spaces that I'm not filled with you, then Lord, tonight is the night where I want more of you. And maybe you don't know what to pray and maybe that's just your prayer, more of you, God, more of you. Even if you repeat that and mean it, I believe that God's gonna do something inside of your life.
So I want to pray over you right now, and then we're going to just spend a little bit more time in worship. God, I'm so grateful because, Lord, even as we've spent a little bit more time tonight than probably really at any other time just talking about the enemy that we face, it's not the end of the story. Because, God, you are victorious. And because of that, we are victorious. But, God, I just pray against this this mindset of being okay with being empty. God, you've not called us to emptiness. You've called us to the fullness of life that comes through relationship with Jesus Christ. So, God, I pray that you will help us to hunger for you again. Help us to want you more than we've ever wanted you before. God, I pray over every person within the sound of my voice that, God, we would strive to be like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand as we worship? The altars are open if you want to come and pray.